is Lon Sapko, co-author of the Social Media Bible, published by John Wiley and Sons, the most comprehensive book ever written on the subject of social media. And today we are here with Biz Stone. How cool is this? The co-founder of uh, Twitter. And uh, we're going to be speaking about microblogging, but more importantly, uh, general communication utility that Twitter is and social media. And of course, we're going to be talking specifically about uh, Twitter. So Biz, uh, totally awesome. I'm, re I'm so happy that you're here today. Thank you. Thank you, Lon. No problem. Well, could you uh, give our listeners, first of all, a little bit of background about who you are and uh, what you do at Twitter? Sure. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Twitter, um, and uh, before that, I helped start a, a service called Zanga.com, which is kind of a, a social journaling uh, service that we started in 1999 in New York City. They're still there, but I left and uh, I ended up working at Google, specifically on the blogger team for a couple of years um, before I left there and sort of got back into uh, our startup world and um, with, a, with a project called Odeo, which is an audio on the internet a podcasting uh, service. And it was actually while at Odeo that Twitter um, was actually a side project that we, that we were working on that we kind of fell in love with and ultimately turned into you know, its own company that just grew and grew and grew and that's where we are at today. It, and that's cool. And I just love Twitter. And just about everybody I know is uh, is tweeting. And for those who, uh, for some reason, uh, grew up in a in a foreign country or something, what is Twitter? Can you explain to the audience what Twitter actually is? Yeah, it's a it's really just a, a short messaging service. Uh, at, at, you know, at the simplest level, but um, and it's a communication utility. But what it becomes uh, now that we have so many people using it, it really becomes kind of the pulse of what's happening with the people, the organizations that you really care about most. So, you know, on the one hand, you use it to just communicate. On the other hand, you look at it, to find, you look to it to find out what's going on. And that's interesting that you say you kind of look through it. And what, I keep hearing a term, it's called uh, tweets, tweeting. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, well, I mean, Twitter is the name of the service. Um, and it you know, comes from the idea, of the, the, the word that you can look up in the dictionary, which is sort of a, a short, trivial um, chirp or burst of, of information, you know, referencing a bird song. And, um, and people are sort of took to calling individual updates. Every time you make an individual update on Twitter, it actually gets saved and archived on Twitter. It becomes its own web page. Uh, and people have been referring to those individual updates as tweets. Uh, and uh, sort of the act of, of twittering, uh, or sometimes they say tweeting because they, they get fond of that word tweet. Um, it's, no, it's nothing that we have sort of ever officially stated. But people people started using it, so it uh, works out well for us. So there's this whole vernacular that's kind of growing up around this technology. <laughs> yes. That's pretty cool. And you say that um, it's a little web page, it's a communication. So basically, it's like a little uh, a text message, if you would. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's a it's a short a short message, a short text message, and uh, people can you know the, one of the key things about Twitter is that it's it's agnostic when it comes to what sort of device you prefer to use uh, to interact with the system. So if you if you prefer to use SMS, so mobile texting on a mobile phone, Twitter will work that way for you. But it also works over the web, and it also works on several thousand right now, probably more in the future, uh, third-party independent pieces of software that you can either download from Mac or a PC or, or use with Flash. Uh, basically, we opened up our infrastructure. We created an API so that smart developers around the world can create custom interactive uh, it's a software to work with Twitter. And that's something that I find really important because on my web page, for example, I'm able to pull in a widget that any tweet that I'm either sending out or following, it just automatically uh, rolls on my website. So if you want to know what I'm tweeting about or Twittering about, you can go to my website and you can see this continuous roll. Uh, so I think opening up, I think that really helped the Twitter community. That, I mean, you think yeah, that was that was actually a big, you know, a, a big win for us. I mean, we did it early on, just to sort of scratch an itch. One of our very early developers wanted to be able to uh, interact with Twitter a certain way, so we created a very simple API. Um, and in fact, what happened was it was, you know, the service is simple and the API was so simple that even uh, beginner uh, API developers could kind of jump in and, and build something on Twitter that worked you know, very quickly, and, and so it became popular to build 
on top of Twitter. And what that did for us was it created so much variety out there of ways of interacting with Twitter um, that it ended up, you know, just creating a lot of traffic and, and creating a lot of opportunities and options for, for people, which is great. Well, it really is a great tool for that reason. I mean, I could be in a different city uh, speaking, and all of a sudden I'll look at my cell phone and I'll know what other people who I'm following. Uh, it continuously tells me where they are, what they're doing, what they're thinking. But also I can be sitting at my computer and I could see those same kinds of updates. So really, whatever device I'm using, whether it's a cell phone or BlackBerry or, or even the, the Internet, that information is really its kind of transparent. It just works on that platform. Yeah. And it was really, it's really that mobile aspect that we that we were trying to get at early. I mean, Twitter was basically inspired by the the, the away messages on IM. So if you if you've ever used AIM or an IM uh, tool, you, you see that your your coworkers or your friends are you know in a meeting out for coffee or whatever, um, and you you can look at the, you can look at sort of a, a group of twelve people and get a sense of what what everyone's doing or what everyone's up to, but you know that's related to the to the computer or you know what they're doing at the computer, um, and so when we took that idea and we just kind of broke it out and we made it more mobile by adding it, the ability to interact over SMS, we made it more social by building in more features. Um, then we then we created basically a new kind of communication, a kind of real time group communication that really didn't exist before, and it's something that it turns out that can be very useful for people. Yeah, it really is. People really kind of count on it, and I, as do I. And you'd mentioned that it's kind of a short message. Is it true to assume that this is limited to 140 characters? Right. We limited we limit Twitter messages to 140 characters primarily um, based on the 160 character limit of text messaging or SMS. Uh, you know, because we need to we need to leave room for the name in front of the message. Um, so that you can tell you can tell who uh, who wrote it, but um, more 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 important than that uh, was the fact that we uh, that we really wanted these messages to be able to work seamlessly across many devices. So if someone created a message on a phone, we wanted it to be able to people to be able to get it on the, on the website and vice versa. Excellent, and. Uh, do, do you think that by restricting people to 140 characters, do you think it changes the type of messages, the the, the thought that goes into it? Uh, I, because my personal experience, I don't see it as a restriction. I kind of see it more as be more succinct. You, yeah, I think so too. I mean, one of the philosophies that we have here at Twitter is that the the constraints sort of inspire more creativity, and that um, when you're faced with these kind of constraints, you're sort of forced to to think a little harder and be a little more succinct and be a little more concise uh, than you normally would. And, you know, we've seen people do amazing things. We've seen people sort of take that constraint and add even more constraint by Twittering only in haiku form and things like this. So um, it's something we've kind of taken to heart. You know, once we once we sort of got behind the, the constraint, we kind of took it to heart, even just at the company itself and with regard to, like, you know, designing features in general and, you know, we'll, Setting up the office space. How can we? How can we think and and be and think within constraints and do a better job and be more creative? Yeah, and I think it really does make it more creative. Um, uh, Samuel Clemens, who was Mark, wrote under the pen name of Mark Twain, said uh, one time, "I apologize for the length of the message. Given more time, it would have been shorter." Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's totally true. I mean, if you've ever really spent some time working on something, you know how much you can. You know you can keep working and keep keep sort of eliminating extraneous information until you really boil it down to its essence. And that is one of the... There's that, there's that and then there's also just the idea of just lowering the bar and, and it's sort of going the other way and saying, look, it's only it's only a sentence or two. Um, you know, if there's something going on right now, just go ahead and, and write it, you know. Yeah. The, um, the idea that you don't really have to fill in multiple forms and it's not expected that you uh, add a photo or anything like that, it's very simple. I mean, I think... That's one of the reasons why folks are drawn to it and why it's just easy to use and you find yourself using it more often. You know, the, the photojournalism student, uh, James Buck, who, who learned about Twitter in Egypt as a way to follow um, uh, activism and protest there, um, and he was arrested by police while photographing one of these protests, didn't have much time to think when, when, when he was thrown in the back of the car. And one of the first things he did was he just grabbed his phone and he texted arrested to his small network of people 
following him both in Egypt and back here in the States. And that was enough to sort of alert his network who, who got, you know, the dean of the college and some lawyers together and, and got him out of that Egyptian jail. But had he, you know, had his mind sort of been encumbered by the idea that he has to think about who to address it to or, you know, which of his friends is this most appropriate to send to or mm-hmm. um, what's the subject of this particular, you know, email or communication. But because it's just simple, it goes out to whoever's following you. Um, that also leads to kind of that more immediacy and that, that easier use case. Yeah, that's really true because I would have to sit down and kind of compose an email. I would look at a subject or maybe a photograph, and I'd be looking at a few minutes as opposed to just one simple word. And that did, in fact, alert his friends and, and network, and he uh, got assistance and was released as a result of that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's really just the power of the network. So all we're doing is connecting the people together, and then they're kind of doing the rest. But making it easier to do is kind of the trick, making it, um, you know, making that the tool that you think of first during those kind of situations which we're seeing over and over again really just comes down to simplifying it because if you're if you're anything like me sometimes I'll, I'll sit down to write an email and I'll actually I'll actually stop and I'll go into something else just because I I can't think of a I, I don't know what the title is going to be I'm not sure which people I should CC and so I'll, I'll say I don't, you know, I don't have time for this right now I'll do it later but in that situation you don't have time to do it later you just have to do it without thinking kind of And it makes it easier for us who are socially media enhanced uh, with all of this data that's coming in for all these different streams where we can just take a look at a Twitter and in just really 15 seconds or less, 10 seconds, you can get the entire message and kind of move on. It makes it easier to digest, I think. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's another thing I think that makes Twitter unique too is that you can be as connected as you want to be. So if you are really an enthusiast of social media and you really want to follow a lot of information, then you can follow a lot of information on Twitter in real time. But there's a different kind of set of expectations that go along with Twitter that that go along with traditional forms of electronic communication, like email or IM. Email or IM, you see people, um, you know, you get an email and you're you're expected to respond to it. It's kind of rude if you don't respond to an email or an an IM message when they know you're online. Uh, With Twitter, you can be hyper-connected if you want to. But you can also kind of step away. You can you can choose to not reply to uh, people, or you can walk away for two days and come back. And, and there's not this concept of having to dig back out. So in many ways, I think it's an evolution of um, the ability to to stay hyper connected, but also to be able to control that information and to not get completely swamped by it. Um, I think is is kind of a new thing that more and more people are going to be looking to as they as they just get it. Totally, totally overwhelmed with all this, you know, email and everything every day. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I can't mention any names, but there's a couple of social media experts uh, that I'm not only friends with but have interviewed, and you can't reach them anymore. They, their cell phone message says, please don't leave me any messages because I'm not even getting cell phone messages. Um, I'm not looking at my email. I'm way too far behind, so don't email me. Just send me a tweet. Yeah, because that's something you can just, you know, you can just scan it or you can skip it. I mean, and it's just a different set of expectations. I think that's where it kind of, yeah, especially when you're overloaded, it works out well for that. It hit a great psychological nerve. You'd mentioned followers and following. Can you just real quick mention what that means? Yeah, it's just, uh, so the whole way Twitter works is it's opt-in. The idea is that we ask a question, and the question is, what are you doing, and, um, Whenever you feel like it, you just answer that question or, you know, you don't have to stick to that format, but that's just the way that we kind of prompt you to enter something. Uh, you know, what are you looking at? What are you seeing right now? What's, what's on your mind? Uh, you do that and you just send it to Twitter. And then the people who get it are people who have chosen to follow your updates or to re- receive your updates. Uh, and the idea, you know, the idea is that sort of as you move around throughout the world uh, answering the question, what are you doing? You have people uh, who are following you on their mobile phones or on their, on their using the web or one of these API projects, and uh, that's all following means really is kind of subscribing to your stream of of uh, answers to that question. And what's great about that is you know you know then that the people who have chosen to follow you have you know, chosen to do so, so you don't have to be too uh, worried about what you update. Um, you know that they asked for it, and you know that they've seen your other updates. So you can kind of let down your guard a little bit, and you don't have to always be, um, you know, 100% on all the time. Or, 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 you know, and, and again, it lowers that barrier and allows you to be able to freely just say, you know, I'm, 
and I'm walking down the street or I'm, I'm at Logan Airport or whatever it is. And, uh, and it, al- it allows you to be free enough to do that that you can extract value from those later. And, and, and that's another thing that I kind, of, I kind of point to as one of the kind of, it's not unique to Twitter. I mean, we've been seeing it over the last 10 years is the communication itself it's just getting more and more open. And, it, and the reason I think that's true is because people are getting value out of being open with their mm-hmm. communication. It's more valuable uh, to tell a, a, a group of potential, a potential group of people what you're up to and see what happens from that than it is to send sort of one-on-one messages. Yeah, I like the fact that it's kind of informal and conversational. Yeah. And one of the things that was interesting is when I did a little research, uh, Robert Scoble has over 21,000 people that uh, is following him, and 34,000 people are actually following him. Uh, th- th- those numbers are just amazing. And then, of course, Kevin Rose, I guess, is uh, taking the prize still. Uh, he's the founder of Dig and Pounce with uh, 64,183 followers. Could you imagine building that large of a trusted network using your communication tool? Yeah, that's a lot. I think, and I think Obama is actually up to like eighty or ninety thousand followers now too. But yeah, I mean, I think you know th- those are those are outlying cases for sure because most. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say most, but you know, we looked it up one time. About fifty percent of people who use Twitter only follow ten people and are followed by the same number. So when you talk about like sort of these um, sort of internet famous or, or or sort of Twitter famous people who get so many followers, that's us that's a very unusual case. Yeah. Um, but it is it is a, a neat sort of position to be in when when you uh, sort of have a question to ask of all those people and want to answer in real time. And honestly, for the social media bible, uh, through this process of developing the different chapters, uh, often over the last six months, I've used uh, Twitter to throw out an idea. What do you think of this? Or who can I get in touch with to talk about that? And it's been a really incredibly good tool because instantly I can reach a large number of people that trust me and that I trust them, and I get the answers almost immediately. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the key is the sort of that immediacy is really helpful. I mean, you might be able to do the same sort of thing over email. It's just that it wouldn't be as immediate. You know, you want that answer right now. I'm I'm shopping for a phone in an AT and T store. Does anyone know what's a what's a good one? <laughs> and you get the answer back from people who follow you. I mean, I, I think that is a real. It comes down to the immediacy of it. That's that it has the unique value. Absolutely. Can you tell me the, the typical demographic, the profile of a person who's using Twitter? Well, not really, because we really don't ask a lot of, of information. I mean, we can go back through and we can do some analysis of, of tw- uh, and we and we have done them in the past. We've done surveys, but we don't. You know, we really just ask for the bare minimum in order to get started on Twitter. So, uh, you know, the best I can do right now is sort of anecdotally say that it's such a wide range. Yeah. Um, it really is like people from all over, all ages, um, and uh, you know, it's just sort of interesting to, to see that it's such a wide range and um, you know in the future we may add a little bit more information allow people to you know tell Twitter a little bit about more about themselves but for now it's really it's just kind of uh, freeform we don't really have a, a lock on exactly what the typical demographic is yeah and based on my research it's everybody I mean it's business people communicating on a business level it's personal communications for recreation it's families communicating with each other um, I've even seen uh, cases where uh, college professors university professors are actually communicating homework assignments and grades and information back and forth with their students I mean it, just about any application you can think of uh, is really popular yeah it's like it's almost like you know it's, it's, it's just, again, when you go back to the communications utility um, aspect of it, it's, it's like asking, like, you know, what is a typical email user or something? I mean, I guess you could you could probably get that, but it would be a very wide range. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any statistics that you can share with our listeners here today? Um, about demographics? A uh, number of users or, or just how many people you have using... <laughs> How many people are signing up? How many are current users? Is any, anything? Oh, sign ups and activity and that sort of thing. Well, we actually we don't give out the, the total number of of sign ups or messages sent per day. Okay. Um, we you know we have like I, I shared that that interesting stat about the fifty percent. Um, we we have been seeing a lot of growth. I mean, over the past ten to twelve months, Twitter's grown to like six hundred percent, and then we, and we tend to see. 
we tend to see a lot of um, just a, a lot of usage around events. Um, you know, any kind of shared event, whether it's a disaster like an earthquake, or uh, you know, the Emmys, or these these especially these debates. Yeah. Uh, we've been seeing kind of record use of Twitter during these debates. People kind of sharing the sharing sharing the debate in real time as they're watching on television and kind of reacting to uh, what the candidates are saying. And so those have been kind of sort of the record the record breaking um, moments for us. But um, but not much in the uh, we don't, we don't usually share absolute numbers. We okay. don't have much in the way to share there. Okay, um, can, it, we, we talked about some of the uh, applications. Uh, for example, the, the the student that was arrested in Egypt. Uh, there was another one that I read about on uh, I believe it was CNN, where somebody had set up a specific Twitter account that uh, he can then broadcast during the San Diego fires, where he was, where the fires were, and everybody from uh, emergency response to the Red Cross was actually using Twitter to understand where all the fires were, where people were trapped, and it, it was a pretty useful tool. Yeah, I think, you know, again, it comes down to that, that real-time aspect. I mean, you know, for example, there was an earthquake a couple of months ago in Los Angeles, and the earthquake struck at 11.42 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and also at 11.42 a.m. were the first Twitter updates coming in from people just all over Los Angeles, at, at school, at work, you know, commuting, um, just immediately reporting in what it felt like, what they were seeing, what, what, what was the scene. Um, and and that was in you know in the first minute of of the earthquake and, and then nine minutes later the AP put out a a wire and you know the AP is sort of known for you know the idea of a of a of a, of a news wire has been around for like 175 years and and that the idea has been that you know you get the get the news out there quickly and in those nine minutes you know we had collected 3,600 um, individual tweets with the you know with the word quake in them. Uh, and you know that's even if you take a sort of um, limited limited idea of how you know, how short or long a uh, a tweet is, you end up with at least a book's worth of of, of Twitter updates, at least fifty thousand words or more um, mm. of updates in those nine minutes about the earthquake, and it's pretty amazing. You know, it comes down to that speed again. It comes down to the and what you were talking about with the with the, with the wildfires is you have people out there. Um, who are kind of just reporting what they're seeing. That can be very useful when you take a sort of more zoomed out look at it. You can say, okay, now we can sort of see people twittering. Where are they seeing fire? Where are they seeing smoke? And you can kind of look at that and get an idea of where these fires are moving, a very unpredictable thing. And it's saving, it's actually saving people's lives. That's the yeah, I mean, ideally, you just, you just allow people to connect and they kind of do the rest. I mean, that, that earthquake is a good example, um, again, because, you know, People just really jump on their cell phones during these kind of events, and what happens is uh, AT&T went down, Sprint went down, Verizon went down. Uh, you know, voice networks for all the, voice service for all those networks went down, but SMS can still get through because of its nature, and and so people are able to Twitter and and connect with one another through the service. And then you know, the, the earthquake, had the earthquake been worse as as it has been in other. Situations, we we probably would have noticed next people then self-organizing and figuring out who needs what. You know, like what was happening recently with this in Atlanta with this gas shortage. People were using Twitter to uh, communicate with one another about where where they could access gas, where was their gas, where they could go and get it. And it's kind of just flared up on Twitter, and we saw it become a, a trend on the, on the on the trends that we monitor. Um, and we looked into it deeper, and we said, "Wow, these are just people who have decided to use Twitter to help each other find gas." So <laughs> you can, you know, the, the key is to just being able to connect, and and then beyond that, to be able to connect in real time and get these things taken care of. You know. Wow. And on a little bit of a lighter note, one of the things that uh, I, I recently uh, discovered in research was is that there's several conferences that have taken place uh, lately where a presenter was up on stage and actually had a monitor set with a um, with a Twitter feed, and during his presentation he can actually read what the audience was twittering him, so he can <laughs> then tailor and customize the actual presentation to what the audience wanted to see real time while the presentation was actually taking place. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a very interesting use case too. The conferences and the and the, uh, the real I, I was once I once um, was interviewed by someone on stage, and they were doing the same thing. They had the audience sending um, suggested questions to him on his cell phone, and then he would just ask me. And you know, I have a friend who's uh, 
who was a director, a, a television and film director in Hollywood, and he had a he had a show, um, a new show that he had directed the the pilot episode of coming on last season, mm-hmm. and I, I went down and visited him at his house, and I pulled up Twitter and I and I showed him what everyone was saying about uh, about the show as they were watching it. So for him, having worked on this thing for I don't know, almost a year or whatever it was, to be able to get that kind of that live audience feel like you might get in a, if you directed a play or something uh, it was really interesting for him to, to see that. That's absolutely amazing. Um, can you um, tell our listeners where they can find out more information about Twitter if they want to go and begin tweeting? Yeah, well, a great place to start with Twitter is actually, um, ironically enough, not necessarily to get started right on Twitter.com, but to go to search.twitter.com and get a sense of of what people are talking about, what they're saying, um, you know, and, and get get kind of a sense of that before you go and you join, which you can do from search on Twitter or from uh, just going to the front page of Twitter.com, which is a little mini tour of Twitter. But, uh, you know, I think we could do a better job of positioning um, Twitter as a relevant communications tool um, as we, you know, as we evolve and as the product gets a little bit better and we, we do a better job of integrating search um, but yeah, search.twitter.com or election.twitter.com is a great way to go if you really want a, a specific window on what's going on with these debates. Okay, good, good, good. Um, and, and one last question is that a lot of these companies are using this pre, uh, freemium uh, kind of a model. How, how do you guys cover the overhead? Is, there, is it advertising based? Uh, you know, how do we pay for this? Yeah, Twitter doesn't have ads. But one of the things one of the things that happened with Twitter early on is it was just a, it was just a project and it was very conceptual and we knew we knew we liked the idea and we thought there was something to it. Yeah. Uh, and what happened uh, for Twitter was it got popular very fast and that was great. That was a good problem to have, but it, it meant that we needed to what we really needed to do more than anything else is no matter no matter what was going to happen uh, and no matter what our plans were for creating a sustainable company. We knew that they depended on creating a reliable network, something that could be used worldwide by a lot of people with a, a you know a, a certain level of confidence. And so, the fact that we got popular popular early meant that we had to kind of scramble in order to get to that that reliability. And that's really what we've been 100% focused on. And in the meantime, what that meant was, strangely enough, was running a company without focusing on revenue. Until we could, um, until we felt we were at a strong place with regard to reliability. So that's kind of the mode we've been in until recently. And now that we're in a good place and uh, with the network and the reliability, uh, we now begin to turn our head sort of to, you know, other features and specifically how do we make this a sustainable company going forward and how do we pay for the, you know, everyone's salaries, all the hosting bills. Yeah. And where, where we're looking now is. Uh, another area where we've been fortunate is a lot of very heavy commercial usage uh, of the service. A lot of companies like Dell announcing that they've made five hundred thousand dollars on Twitter last quarter, and wow. and Comcast using it in this very interesting hybrid way of combining marketing and, and customer support together, and JetBlue using it to uh, communicate with its um, customers and Whole Foods and what we've seen with the the NASA organization, although it's not a commercial entity, just amazing success in achieving their goals of bringing, you know, making the science more accessible to to the the U.S. citizens and the world. Um, So we're seeing a lot of commercial usage, and I think we're going to kind of look to that as as one of the early ways that this company becomes more sustainable. And I think that's great because I think everybody would be willing to pay something to to keep this service going because uh, even the few times that um, you guys get overloaded, I mean, everybody goes into tw- Twitter meltdown because <laughs> right. <laughs> we, yeah, I think the key is to, you know the key is for, for again for this network for this to work. The network wants to be large and and it needs to be something that's free and easy for a whole lot of people. So that's why the commercial usage is a little bit more interesting because if there are big companies that are clearly using the service. Um, to earn money, uh, then you know it's it's very possible that they're willing to put a little money towards it. And it's reasonable to ask that. I mean, that's yeah. a reasonable business case. Is there anything else that's that you'd only- like to add about uh, Twitter that you you think our listeners might want to know something coming down the road or philosophy or summarize? Uh, you know, I mean, I think just uh, well. There's a lot of philosophies, but I don't, <laughs> yeah. don't want to necessarily belabor everyone with those. 
But the uh, you know just the idea that it really is um, not necessarily a social network, but it is a it is a communications network with uh, with these social aspects. Good point. I think uh, sometimes it gets confused with with some of the social networks out there, but I, I think we're a little bit different than that. I think we have a, a sort of a broader appeal and we are more more of a complement to these uh, these networks rather than um, another one of them. I absolutely totally agree. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'd really like to thank Biz Stone, the co-founder of Twitter, for being here today and talking about uh, uh, Twitter and uh, communication and a little bit about microblogging, but the, the bigger picture. And uh, honestly, Biz, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lon. This has been Lon Sapko, co-author of the Social Media Bible. Be sure to check out our other valuable social media tactics, tools, and strategies that can be found in the Social Media Bible book and its companion website, www.thesocialmediabible.com. For more information about me, Lon Sapko, please go on over to my website at www.lonsapko.com. And again, Biz, truly and honestly, thank you for taking the time here today. This is great. Thanks, Lon.